the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Sainthood, holiness. Those words uh, might make us a little uneasy. At least I've heard a lot of people say, whenever we get to the point of reminding all, that all baptized believers are called saints in the New Testament, and the response is usually a kind of aw shucks, you know, not me. <laughs> you know, I know they're intimidating. But then when you consider that even the word God is scary to people who don't know him. And, and so, you know, you, even Christians will respond when, uh, to God's uh, call to be holy. Get a little nervous. Get a little, you know, pleading, false modesty, and kind of, you know, kind of forgetting that holiness is God's gift to us. I mean, basically, that's what the psalm is saying to us. God takes pleasure in saving his people. And, and in his pleasure, he wants us to grow, to be more like his character that we see in Jesus. I mean, the reality for you and me is that we're not only called to be saints, but God gives us the grace to be His holy people, His chosen people, a kingdom of priests, a people who serve Him and worship Him and proclaim Him. And so today when we celebrate the memory of the saints who have gone before us, we basically are giving thanks that God gave them as examples for us and that they are encouraging us with their prayers because we are one with them in the communion of saints, not slackers, saints. And, and so what we do today in, in remembering them is basically praying to be like St. Paul, who said, look at me, follow my example. That's what it means. That's what God's calling you and me to be and to do. To be examples not only to your brothers and sisters in the church, but to the world of God's holy love. And so, you know, the psalm assures us that this is God's gift and his joy when we receive that. And then Jesus gave us the Beatitudes, the blessings, to show us what that means, what it looks like. It's kind of like, you know, the love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, you know, often called a portrait of Jesus, but it's also a portrait of the disciples, those of us who follow Jesus, this is what God is calling us to become by His grace. And so the Beatitudes are really central, <coughs> really central to the gospel, central to following Jesus. Now, in the, in the past, well actually there are some people who still have this problem. The, Beatitudes have been misunderstood and misinterpreted. Some people see them as a new set of rules that you have to meet in order to qualify to enter the kingdom of heaven, kind of like merit badges. You know, and I, I like flunk Boy Scouts, so I don't have any merit badges. But, uh, another misinterpretation is to take it that these Blessings are only in the future when Christ comes again and in his second advent. And so in other words, they're not for us now. 
But then you wonder, why did Jesus give them to us if they're not for now? A third kind of misinterpretation is to say that this is God's absolute ethical demand for his people to be perfect, which is impossible for us. And so, therefore, their purpose is to simply motivate us to repent, to uh, realize how far we sh fall short of the glory of God. In other words, kind of like that song from man from La Mancha called The Impossible Dream, you know. Again, nothing that Jesus gave us is intended to tantalize us with an impossible demand. I mean, that's just playing a joke on us. That's cruel. So what, in heaven's name? are the Beatitudes, and, and, and what are they for? Well, I would suggest to you that instead of these misinterpretations, the Beatitudes show us the heart of God's Word, the heart of His purpose, His will for us, and to show us what it means to live in the grace of the Holy Spirit. I mean, really, it, 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 it's consonant with some other passages that you know. For instance, Colossians chapter 3, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. God wouldn't tell us to seek them unless they were possible, unless they were available. Seek the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. In other words, what we are to be about here and now. And then from Philippians chapter 4, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, Whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. I mean, these are the things that the Beatitudes flesh out and show us what is true, just, honorable, and worthy of praise. And then finally from uh, 1 Peter, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So the Beatitudes show us what it is like to walk in the light, what following Jesus is all about. And so uh, what I'd like to do is... Uh, do a quick recap of the Beatitudes with a little description. The first four, the first four Beatitudes have to do with God's gift to us of a, a saving relationship with Him. Or to put it technically, the first four have to do with justifying grace, making us right with God one with God, through Christ. I, I rather like how uh, uh, Eugene Peterson, in the message, paraphrases these first four. Here they are. You're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there is more of God and His rule. You're blessed when you feel you've lost what is most dear to you. Only then can you be embraced by the one most to you. You're blessed, this is my favorite, you're blessed when you're content with just who you are. No more, no less. That's the moment you find yourselves proud owners of everything that cannot be bought. And then you're blessed when you've worked up a good appetite for God. He's food and drink and the best meal you are ever eating. I mean, you hear that. This is God's saving grace. 
This is the <coughs> blessing of being accepted in Him and our glad acceptance of that gift. I mean, the word blessing uh, basically means uh, God's gift of well-being. Or another way to say it would be happy and holy are the poor in spirit who know they're not God, but that the Lord seeks us and loves us and we depend on him. Uh, the, the, the second beatitude has to do with mourning. <coughs> Blessed are those who mourn. And this is often, I think, for that taken out of context. Because Jesus is here talking about the relationship we have with God and the kingdom of God. And so what we mourn, what he's talking about, is the grievous, penitent repentance of our sins. And the sins of the world. What Jesus is describing here are his saints who weep. And, and one of the, it's interesting, one of the common characteristics of those that the church officially designates as saints in the calendar is that the more they matured in faith, the more they grew in holiness, the more deeply aware they were of their own sinfulness. It, it simply goes together. I know it sounds like a paradox, but it's one of those twin truths that God gives us, two sides of the coin. The greater our, the awareness of our sin, the greater our joy in His forgiveness. We will be comforted. We will be strengthened because we know God's mercy in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then we can go on to <coughs> the next one, uh, which is... Uh, Again, often taken out of context. Blessed are the meek. The <coughs> word at its root means the gentle. It's basically where we get the English words gentle woman, gentle man. Which originally meant people of a noble character. People who sought to honor God, and people who sought to be courteous and kind <coughs> to others. That's what the meek means. It simply means uh, that we are seeking, with God's grace, to be saints. And the promise with that blessing is that we would inherit the earth. <coughs> Let's unwrap that for a moment. The earth here could really means the land. It really means the promised land. The meek will inherit the kingdom of God, which is what the promised land really is. It means heaven itself. We can have a foretaste of heaven now by receiving the meekness of God's love and sharing it. it, it and then uh, we, we can go on to the next one to uh, uh, desire God's righteousness. I mean, this is His gift to us in Christ by the Holy Spirit. And the more we want it, guess what? The more we have it. I mean, basically, in the end, God gives us what we want. If we want Him, we have it. <coughs> if we don't want Him, in the end, He will say, have it your way. Which is, of course, tragic and sad and breaks up time. <coughs> now, after that beatitude, there's a shift. The last five of the beatitudes really describe what we would call sanctification. <coughs> you know, growing in holiness, growing in um, living in a true and, and active <coughs> faith, sharing God's love with others. And, and so um, this is what it looks like 
to live in God's grace, to be merciful. In other words, as we pray the Lord's Prayer, you know, uh, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us, to use a modern version. In other words, to share what God gives us. When we don't share it, then the water of life dams up and we dry up and, and, and we wonder where God is. At the root of that spiritual desert often is a lack of forgiveness on our part of those who have hurt us. And then the pure in heart. I mean, this is, this is all the teaching that Jesus gave about how outward, ritual, formal, Purity doesn't count for much. It really didn't help the Pharisees much. But rather, what he's really saying that in our hearts, in our wills, when we are single-minded <coughs> on pleasing God, He is deeply joyous. He is pleased. And we can know the well-being, the happiness, and the holiness of God's servant. It's what we mean by following Jesus. And it says in the blessing that we will see God. <coughs> which is you know, rather remarkable. Uh, because Moses never saw the face of God. <coughs> in the Gospel of John, the first chapter tells us that no one has ever seen God. And yet, this blessing says that we will see God. And of course, this, uh, this is fulfilled in Christ, through Christ, by Christ, you know, in the end, in heaven itself. As you heard in the description of the worship of the saints in heaven, all of the faithful departed <coughs> around the throne of God, with all the angels worshiping Him. And, and you know, I know people make fun of, you know, about playing harps and singing in heaven. It must be rather tedious after a while. Actually, <laughs> actually, worship is what we're intended for. It's what God made us to do. And when we truly worship God from the heart, there is the greatest joy in life. And so basically he's saying, you're going to have a rollick and good time. Because <laughs> it's going to be the best liturgy you ever enjoy because you will be in the immediate presence of God. You will see His face. Well, that's what Revelation says in the last chapter. Um, no longer will there be anything accursed but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it. And his servants will worship Him. They will see His face and His name will be on their foreheads. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign for them. It's a fairly happy uh, circumstance. No wonder Paul said, no, I, don't want, you know, I don't know what to do. I can stay here, go be with the Lord. And, um, and, and the saints often have the same kind of struggle. Uh, well, then we get to peacemaking. And again, it would be very easy to take a shallow, worldly understanding to be a peacemaker, to you know, be a skilled negotiator, an arbiter, an arbiter, you know, between human conflicts. That's not what it means. Blessed are the peacemakers means blessed are those who not only enjoy living in God's shalom, his his well-being, his gift of harmony and contentment. But who share that? How do we share that? Well, we share it by praying for others, especially those who don't know the Lord. By sharing our faith, by sharing Jesus, by introducing them to <coughs> the peacemaker, the king of peace, the prince of peace. He is our show. That's why it always bugs me a little bit when we get sloppy and when we get to the peace and the liturgy. You know, 
know, people begin to say, peace. Well, it's chillo. <coughs> that's adequate. But it would be better to use what the prayer book says and say, the peace of the Lord. Because it's his peace that passes all understanding that we're sharing. Not just worldly peace free of you know conflict. But you're sharing oneness with God. Well, anyway. So, you know, this is what befits the children of God. Because then we look like Jesus when we share God's shalom with Him. And, and then we get toward the end when we put God first above everything else and therefore open ourselves to lose the treasures of this world, to be persecuted, to be discriminated which is an increasing reality in Western culture and a bloody reality in the rest of the world. I mean, there are, you know, I'm sure Travis has told you, there are more martyrs to be made today than in the early church or ever in the history of the church. I mean, we are living in an age of persecution and martyrdom. And, and what Jesus is saying, is that when we put him first above any reward in this world, then we can be assured and enjoy the reward in heaven. That's what that first reading from Job was is really all about. It was a remarkable kind of prevision of, of what God is giving us in Jesus. For I know that my reward and at the last he will stand upon the <coughs> In my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall be <coughs> and not another. That's what it means. You know, to be blessed, putting God first in our life. Um, and so the first five have to do with justification. The last, I mean the first four, the last five have to do with sanctification. The, the fruits of the Spirit showing forth in our lives. And all these blessings are God's gift to us as we trust Jesus, follow Jesus, praise and serve Jesus. And we're one with all the saints in the communion of saints. We are called to be saints. We don't have to apologize. We don't have to say, oh, shut <coughs> No. Unless you are willing to say, God, give me the grace to be your witness, to be, your, to be an example of your love in the world, then something is missing. Something essential. And so you are you know, a royal a holy nation, a royal priesthood. You are those who are citizens of heaven, showing the citizens of this world what it's like to enjoy God by sharing what He gives us. And this is all God's gift. So I want to just simply end with um, one of my favorite. The Lord be with you. Also with you. Let us pray. Dear Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we hold up all our weakness to your strength, our failure to your faithfulness, our sinfulness to your perfection, our loneliness to your compassion, our pains to your great agony on the cross. We pray that you will cleanse us, strengthen us, guide us, so that in all things our lives may be lived as you would have them lived, without cowardice and for you alone. <laughs> Show us how to live in true humility, true contrition, true faith, and true love. Amen. Amen. In the name of the living God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.